Hello and welcome back. In our previous lectures, we have looked at two variants of cloud-based platform. First was infrastructure as a service and the second was platform as a service. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about software as a service variant of cloud platforms. In the subsequent files, we will see more details on this. Okay, let's start by looking at how NIST has given a definition for software as a service. It says that software as a service is a capability which a con cloud consumer can use where he accesses the applications running on the provider's cloud infrastructure. And the applications are typically accessed by using some sort of a thin client device such as a web browser. In that sense, what the consumer gets is the software directly usable by the client. It's not typically the case that the consumer is required to do any sort of programming or any such thing. The consumer is directly accessing the application functionality. Some of the examples of SaaS are Google Sites, RSmart, Sky Learning Management System, and YouTube Video Streaming, for example. These are, these are the key uh, examples. For instance, in case of Google Sites, one can customize the website. For example, you can add the widgets, and also you have the integration with Google Services. Now, in this case, each individual consumer, for example, you are using Gmail, which is a SaaS example. Similarly, Google Sites, as I said, is another example from Google suite of applications where each individual user of that service can customize the service for his or her own needs. You can customize Gmail, you can put different themes, etc., and set different rules for filtering messages and someone, someone else can use a different set of filters and so on. So in that sense, you are able to customize the software. Whereas you are not doing any coding per se, or you are not even responsible or even aware of where the application is actually deployed and running. Similar is the case with other examples like uh, RSmart Sakai learning management system. So a learning management system is like this very site where we are hosting your class website. Sakai offers several features which an individual instance of this system can be customized for. Like we have included some subset of features. We have included, let's say a chat room, a forums, announcements tool, etc. Some other instance of Sakai may have a different set of features enabled. So in that sense, even though the consumer is using a software and they're not doing any coding or not even maintaining the underlying operating system and other infrastructure where it is running, they are just consuming the service from RSmart where they have pre-deployed the software and they are offering it as a service to you. That is the software to be used by the end user directly, not doing any sort of coding again. Similar is the case with YouTube streaming. YouTube gives you ability to upload your videos and stream them to your, uh, to your users where they can view it on a variety of different devices and they allow you different tools which you can use to enhance and edit your videos and let you do some sort of uh, access some analytics information about who watched your videos from where and how many likes are there for a video and so on. So here again, you're not doing any coding to obtain that functionality. The functionality being, let's say, editing and enhancing the videos, for example, and streaming the videos to your users. All you're doing is going to the YouTube website, logging on after assuming that you have registered there and uploading your video and streaming it again. So in all these examples, what you get is software to use and just customize the software for your own needs without doing any sort of coding or without ever worrying about the underlying infrastructure. So if you compare it with the previous examples of cloud platforms, which were differentiated by service models, we saw infrastructure as a service where you had a very raw control of underlying computing infrastructure right from the operating system and upwards. And then we saw a platform as a service where some, where some responsibilities of maintaining and managing the infrastructure was taken away from you as a user. Somebody else was managing it for you. And that eased some of your tasks so that you could focus on writing code of your application. And now we have moved to yet another level of uh, abstraction where somebody else has written the entire business application for you and you are just registering for their service and consuming it. And the application is such that it is giving features for customizing its behavior, as we uh, just saw in these examples, so that you can address your business needs. Let's look at the architecture. So typically you will have uh, some core business functionality 
that the application may be offering, the service that you're getting, the S part, the software part. So it may have some core business functionality like we saw in the example of uh, Google Sites. So creation of a dynamic website is the functionality here, core functionality. And then you may have another piece which is dealing with the reporting and dashboard, etc. That is where you are as a user, you are able to go and see how many users, for example, have accessed your site if you are talking of Google Sites. Right? And you are able to tune certain parameters, let's say, of how the application behaves for your case, your particular case. And then you may have user management where you are able to this is this user management is here discussed from the standpoint of the SaaS provider. That is, if you look at Google Sites, Google Sites uses Google accounts to manage the users of Google Sites, right? So, so SaaS providers has to have a user management where they can offer this service to different users and they're able to do billing and quota management and other kind of activities per user, per user of the service. And then uh, this is the billing part where they're able to charge individual users based on how many resources they have used and so on. And this whole thing is integrated by some common uh, thread which is dependent on the application itself. And then typically you will have a data store uh, which, is, which is holding all the persistable information which a core functionality of that service will require. So these are the typical components which you will see in a software as a service. Now, having seen all these examples and a little bit on the architecture detail, okay, so we have some idea of what we mean by software as a service. We have looked at the definition, some examples, and also looked at the architecture of a typical SaaS offering. What are the characteristics of a SaaS cloud? In case of SaaS, the user, the cloud user, only gets to control the some configuration parameters of the software that he or she is using. And you do not get any control of the infrastructure that lies underneath. You, that is, you don't have any access or even visibility of the underlying servers, operating system, storage, and any other individual application capabilities. And as I said, it allows only a limited control of user-specific application configuration settings. Typically, there is no programming involved as we have seen in some of the examples we discussed. All you get to do is directly the functionality. You just consume the functionality through typically a thin client like a browser. And the user generated data can be exploited by the cloud provider. And in that sense, privacy can be an issue. Gmail, for example, if you look at, they show you some context, uh, they show you some contextualized advertisements on the right pan of your Gmail. They are able to do that by doing some sort of analytics on the content of your messages. So even though they may say that in their privacy policy that no human user is accessing your email content, but still there is there is uh, some chance that there is there is some analytics happening on all your data and all the users data. So that is what we mean by that the content, the information generated or collected through a SaaS service can be exploited by the or used by the cloud provider. And it may not necessarily mean a violation of any privacy context. We are just saying that by, by using someone else's information, a provider may be able to derive some additional benefits, which the user may or may not be aware of. So as a designer or as a user, it's, it's uh, good to be aware of these kind of possibilities. Now let's look at side by side all these uh, service model based variants of infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service and software as a service. So if you see here the ones which are highlighted in blue is what a vendor will manage and the ones in a lighter green uh, on the top they are the ones which you as a user will manage. So in case of infrastructure as a service you see that uh, upwards of virtualization layer Everything else is the responsibility of cloud user. That is, you are responsible for making sure that your operating system that you deploy and run on the virtual machine given to you by IES vendor, you are responsible for making sure that it is in a usable condition and anything that runs on top of it is your responsibility to manage. And when you move towards the right to the platform as a service, Someone else is managing the underlying stuff for you. That is, you are relieved of the overheads of managing the runtime, middleware, operating system, and all the underlying stuff. 
all you focus is on your application and data and on the SaaS case everything is managed by the vendor you directly get to use the functionality export uh, exposed to you typically by some sort of a web application which can be consumed through different types of thin clients so this slide gives you a high level big picture view of all the three variants of cloud which are based on service models you see how the vendors as well as consumers responsibilities vary between these three and who is responsible for managing and providing what components what layers in each of these variants it can also be seen in a different way here now what we have in this diagram is from the left if you see there is a role of the end user here and then you have a developer somewhere here and the vendor shown in the bottom this circle as a yellow smiley the vendor provides let's say infrastructure as a service he combines some software and an application can be created which the consumer can consume so in this layer which is highlighted here in the middle uh, by the dotted boundary the developer is adding this thing so that's where the developers come in so you add some piece of software here pay attention to the size of the so box representing the software so in infrastructure as a service this is the largest box which means you have to add or deal with some more amount of software that is what we were trying to depict in the previous slide where you see the the software here managed by the user is more so you have application data runtime middleware and operating system so all of this is software right so you have infrastructure as a service in this case you are adding some software to create an application finally usable system by somebody to consume and when you move to pass you have slightly less thing to add to the underlying stuff to create some application something useful and similarly when you move to the uh, software as a service you have the smallest box here which means you don't have any kind of software to write but still we have indicated it as uh, software because here in this uh, for the sake of simplicity we are saying that uh, even the configuration is something that you add to the offering from the platform and finally get something usable by the consumer so that's yet another view of seeing how a useful application functionality can be created in each of these cases so in the subsequent lecture we will look at uh, the deployment model based variants of the cloud and for this lecture that's pretty much it and see you in the next lecture